this tremendous split between the Greek speaking and the Latin speaking church. And that gives you some historical information about it. All right. We are now going to look at John and John's uh, uh, understanding of the Trinity. It's probably the most mature. Uh, of, of, of all the writings other than Paul. I, I, I think that uh, I think that's what Smale says under letter D there on page 50. Of all the New Testament writings, it is in John that the identity and distinctness of Son and Spirit become subjects of conscious interest and reflection. Where other New Testament approaches may major either on the identity of the two or their distinctness, John wants to hold both together. However, it's still distinct, but interdependent. He says, for John, and let's, let's go to um, the Upper Room Discourse in the Gospel of John. That's chapters 14 through 17. We're going to look primarily at 16 and 17 in John. And actually, the, the origin of the filioque controversy comes from the Gospel of John. And you'll, you'll notice when you uh, read the handout there, uh, what we have there, it, it talks about, it's where Jesus says that the Spirit will be sent by the Father and the Son. Now, being sent by the Father and the Son is different from the creed that deals with the spirit proceeding from the Father alone. All right, now we've got we you got to get some handouts here too. I don't know uh, about yeah, getting to uh, yeah. Could you make handouts everything that you have and give to him? All right. All right. But the filioque controversy is actually uh, has its source in these verses uh, in the Gospel of John. So let's let's look at first of all. Now remember John's particular word, the word that Jesus use, uses to describe the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John in the Greek is parakletos. That can mean, sometimes it's just, it's, it's transliterated directly as the paraclete. You know, you've, you've heard it called the paraclete. Sometimes it is translated the advocate. Sometimes it's translated the helper. All of these ideas are there. Uh, advocate helper, but what a parakletos is, is a defense attorney. I mean, but that's what an advocate is, somebody who comes to your side to help you, to assist you with a, a legal problem or a personal problem or a medical problem that you have. This is John's term for the Holy Spirit, and he says, uh, in the notes, for John, the coming of the Paracletos is the going away of Jesus. Look at John 16, verse 7. Jesus says, and he's, remember, this is the upper room discourse. This is the final thing, uh, thing that he shares with his disciples before he goes to the cross. The final teaching. And it, it goes through chapters 14, 15, and 16. And then, of course, finishes with the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17. Jesus says in verse 7, he tells his disciples, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For I, if I do not go away, the helper, the advocate, the paracletos, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, there is never any, it is a biblical issue that the Son sends the Spirit, okay? But as far as where the Spirit proceeds from, the Spirit proceeds from the Father. One of the issues that, that, that we have, remember we're going back and forth from Latin to Greek, Latin to Greek, and sometimes a word that means one thing in Latin means something different in Greek. That was something that the early fathers had to face. 
they had to face when part of the empire spoke Latin and part of the empire spoke Greek. Now when all the fathers come together and they're, they're, they're making these creeds, they, they have to make sure that their words are being translated. It's not a whole lot different for me in Colombia when I'm going from English to Spanish and somebody is telling me I said this or I said that. But Jesus does send the Spirit, although in the same Gospel he says, whom the Father and I send. In other words, Jesus, there, there's no, no uh, contradiction of the understanding that the Father is the leader of the Godhead. He's the, 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 the word that was used by the Greek fathers is he's the monarch, the monarch. The monarch is the only principle, the, the primary ruler, the primary leader. That's from monos and archos. And he's the father was the monarch. He was the, the, the head, if you will, of the Godhead. The helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. So, so for John and Smales notes, the coming of the Paracletus is the going away of Jesus. Now, he says, here he is nearest Luke, but in another sense, the coming of the Spirit is also the coming again of Jesus. And if you look at 14.8, Jesus says this, the, the same thing. Uh, he's, uh, John's doing a little of his dialectical thinking here. John is very dialectical, although uh, I have been told that the, and, and I agree with it, the proper way of stating it biblically is that the, it's not so much that the Bible has this is, is dialectical thinking. That means taking two apparently contradictory statements and putting them together and really seeing a fuller reality. But rather paradoxical is the more biblical terminology. When we talk about, we use the term the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the mysteries of God, the mysteries of the spirit. Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. Musterion, the Greek word, is close to meaning, I show you a paradox. Something that may appear to be to contradict itself from a human standpoint, but from God's standpoint, does not. It's just simply that because we are created beings, it's hard for us to hold these two thoughts together that appear to be so opposite. I mean, the, the, the triune Godhead itself is a human contradiction. How can three be one and one be three? We do not have three gods. To speak of three gods is polytheism, it's tritheism, it's heresy. We don't have three gods, we have one God. But that one God reveals himself in three different persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. So the very essence of the ground of reality of our universe, Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons, one God, is a paradox. So it shouldn't surprise us when we deal with paradoxes in Scripture. We've already discussed one, you know, if we, if we get our good Calvinists and Armenians together. We've got sovereignty of God versus the freedom of the human will freedom of human choice. This is why, and I, I mentioned this to Andrea earlier today, and by the way, this is the book, uh, Smale's book, The Giving Gift. My, personally speaking, what I consider, the, if, if we're going to look at a, a, a church polity uh, throughout the history of the church, and at least in modern times, come closest to what I think is is probably the right way to do church is Anglicans. The Anglicans got it right. And I'll tell you why the Anglicans got it right. The Anglicans were the, were what, what their, their credo was the Via Medea. And the Via Medea was the middle path, the middle road. They saw the Roman Catholic, the high church, creedal church, historical church reality over here. They saw the Reformation, Luther and Calvin and all the free churches over here and they said we are we, we are separating from Rome but we are not becoming pure reform church we're going to find the middle road we're going to take the best of the historical church and the best of the new things that God is doing in the Holy Spirit and, and, and through the Reformation and they have historically held 
that path. They're always trying to find a middle ground. Smale's depiction of Peter uh, answering for himself but not by himself, to me, resolves much of the Arminian Calvinistic conflict because it shows human will acting, human beings choosing, but not by themselves. The Spirit of God always is at work in us. And Smale's a, Smale is, a, a, is an Anglican, and he's, a, he, he's very good at what he does. He, he really has been trained well uh, as an Anglican. It's also why I like Father Ken Tanner, spirit-filled Anglican in Detroit Partnership. I love listening to what he has to say, because it's always the via media. Every time, like, here we go, the via media. We're getting in the middle there. But what Smale is pointing out is, look at what 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 chapter 14 says. He says, and actually, I think that's a I think that's a that's a misprint. Um, it's it should be 1418, not 148. That's a that's a typo there. The coming of the Spirit is the coming again of Jesus in 1418. Just as 16, 7, Jesus says, I have to leave so the Spirit can come. I go, the Spirit comes. In 14, 18, he says, I'm going to leave, the Spirit is going to come, and I'm going to come again with the Spirit. Paradox there, paradox. And this is what he says. He says in verse 16, I will pray the Father, John, John 14, 16, and he will give you another helper, another comfort. And by the way, that's right. Parakletos can also be translated comforter. Thank you, Joyce. That's, that's how it's, I think of the old King James. You always quote the King James for me, so I, it gets me back to my roots there. That's good. The comforter, that's also part of the nuance of this meaning of the Parakletos. He's an advocate, a helper, a defense attorney, a comforter. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, another comfort, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. In other words, the faceless person, the person without a face. The world doesn't see him. The world doesn't receive him. The world doesn't abide in him and with him, but you will. You will know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Well, I have to leave so the Spirit will come, but when the Spirit comes, I'll be coming back as well. So you see, it's this distinct but interdependency here. We go back to Smale's notes. In the upper room discourses, there is a subtle interplay of the two themes of identity and distinctness of the Son and Spirit in a manner that goes a considerable distance in preparing the way for a fully fledged Trinitary understanding of what is to follow. In John, we can find the same tendency we have noted in Paul to emphasize the distinctness of the Son and Spirit in context that have to do with confession and prayer. Now we go to John 16, 13, and 14. Jesus defines the ministry of the Spirit in relation to his own. Now you can either read the translation in your own scripture, or he actually translates it here. He says, and this is what Jesus says about the Spirit, he will guide you into all the truth. See, that's a person's guide. That's, that's an aspect of person. He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will not draw attention to himself, is an alternate translation. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take what is mine and will make it known to you. Now, and Olvin brought this up earlier, we have our definition of glory right here. This is a definition of glory. Now, first of all, notice there are things that belong to the Father, His. There are things that belong to the Son, it's mine. And there are things that the Spirit will receive from both the Father and the Son, and there are things that the Son receives from the Father. There is something that each one possesses that they give and they share with each other. 
the definition of glory, and we see it at the bottom of the page, the definition of glory is what one divine person gives to another divine person. What that person gives to the other person, we call it glory. That's, that's, that's important to understand. And look at my little note in the side margin where I say definition of glory at the bottom of the page. The key phrase is, he will bring me glory. In John's theology, glory is that which one divine person gives to another. Neither father nor son glorifies himself, but each glorifies the other. So here the Spirit brings the Son a glory that, the, that Jesus, the Son, does not have in himself, but that comes to him through the activity of the Spirit in his disciples. See, this whole issue of giving and receiving is what glory is all about. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving again. I'm moving again. <laughs> I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. Uh, you see, I caught myself there. No flags were waved. The Holy Spirit said, go back and give what you have to give in front of the game. <laughs> this is important because grace, the word for grace, we talked about it yesterday. Grace means a gift, that which is given as a gift. When the Spirit is described as the gift of the Spirit, it's dorea. It's something that is freely and graciously given. Joyce? Can you say that the grace of God? God's grace is God's favor to us. Yes, we can. So when God gives us something, it's always based on grace. It is freely given. It is a favor. It is graciously given. It is given out of love. It is an act of love. So when the Father takes what is His and gives it to the Son, that's glory. When the Spirit comes to the Son and takes from the Son what is of the Father and what is of the Son, that's glory. And when the F Father and the Son give to us through the Spirit, when the Spirit gives us what belongs to the Father and the Son, that is glory. So when we're talking about the glory of God being manifested in the body of Christ, it has to do with receiving God's grace, receiving God's favor, receiving God's life. And the thing we need to understand here, this is something that is done freely and willingly by God's Spirit. When the church says, when, when, when the church says, God, why is this happening? God, why aren't you answering my prayers? God, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? What we are doing is we are failing to receive what God freely gives to us. It isn't that God's not giving that we're not receiving. There's something built into our nature and our culture that causes us not to receive what God gives us, not to receive all of them. Um, actually, you, you were getting into it where I was going to ask about the, we, I think as a body we need more more teaching, and I say not teaching, because I think we've kind of talked to the actual practicum where we're actually exercising the art of receiving, mm -hmm. because there's a way people say, I receive, I receive, but they don't know how to properly receive because there's no thankfulness attached to it. Amen. And see, a, a lot of that from us as a body of Christ, we can defile a thing that's a gift by not being thankful. Absolutely. You now, was she here last night or what? No. That's exactly, you, everything you brought up is what we taught last night. So you're, 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 you're moving in the spirit. You're kind of confirming what we were talking about last night. We were talking about being thankful. No, I'm, I'm sorry because oh, no, this no, this is, I'm having it, it's cool. Pastor Ken, it's like it's awesome. We, we got we give and we give and give like every Thursday. We're giving stuff to people. Every but there's a level of unthankfulness that will sure. always keep people sure. where they're at because sure. they don't know how to receive properly. Absolutely. I think the body of Christ don't know how to see our our Lord Jesus Christ and the gift He given to us as the Holy Spirit because we don't understand the actual layers of multitudes because we haven't become in relationship with the Holy sure. Spirit as a person. So Everything you're saying is the very reason why I'm hammering this issue of relationship. What I believe is happening to us in the 21st century, at least in our culture, but I believe in all the cultures of the world, is 
people are desiring more and more and more to have authentic relationships, real relationships, valid relationships. And I believe the Lord is pressing the issue in the, in the church because whenever God press, presses an issue, when the Spirit is pressing an issue, it's because the Spirit is going to be poured out in our midst and it's going to teach us and show us. When the Holy Spirit, oftentimes when things are taught, that they're taught to posture us, to prepare us, to position us, to turn us, to really be prepared for what God is doing. And the very fact that there's so much discussion on relationship, there's, I mean, we're going down to Master Builders, and the Master Builders Conference this year is going to be on, guess what? Relationships. You know, it's Everything we're talking about is relationships, because the Holy Spirit is going to be doing a powerful, mighty work in the midst of the church, and it's going to, it's going to bring those things to pass that we're talking about and we're looking toward God to fulfill. And this is my last comment as far as this goes, <laughs> is that in regards to conferences and, uh, and those con uh, conventions and things, I'm a, I am really <coughs> consider myself part of the new school, of the younger generation, and we're at a point we need to have open demonstration because my parents and my grandparents have failed me to show me how the Holy Spirit operates in their life. All I've seen is a brokenness and a lack of promises fulfilled in their life because sure. the lack of the Holy Spirit operating or their willingness not to allow the Holy Spirit operating in their life. Well, so that's I said, and I guess what I'm saying is that as a body of young people, we need our parents, those who are mature in Christ, to actually start demonstrating this stuff to us. Because mm -hmm. we're comfortable Absolutely. out. We're talked out. We don't want to hear anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm, again, I'm a young person. Right. So you right. know, I'm just coming from a young person type of view. We, we go to like etiquettes, how to eat properly, how to sit with the, you know, those who are of high status. But where are we going to have classes where we are taught how to receive and actually demonstrate that in, in our lives? So I guess that's where I'm at. I mean, we, we're conference. I think I'm just going from you saying you have a convention and everything. That's great. Right. But what we're going to do, because we, we can have the big wigs there with all the Holy Spirit feel, but it doesn't trickle to the all the parts of well, the it, 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 it doesn't trickle because Sorry, it, it, it doesn't trickle because this because we're not allowing the spirit to move that way. But but again, those who feared the Lord, scripture says, spoke with one another. See, it has to be taught and it has to be discussed. So the spirit is drawn to that language and drawn to that talk. And the spirit is going to move. The spirit is going to move in those areas. And and actually, part of the proclamation, part of the talking, it's it's the prophetic voice in the church saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And it's going to come. It is going to come. Joyce. Well, I, I don't think everybody is at the same level in the church as far as faith. True. And it's not something that happens overnight, because the Bible tells us that we will know as we follow want to know, and then you'll grow from stage to, to mostly in your experience with the Lord. Because I know most of what I learned as far as the leading of the Holy Spirit was my experiences that I had when the Holy Ghost would come to my defense. Um, uh, when you go to your extreme, you don't really need the, uh, I'm trying to say, the Holy Ghost works in different ways, praise mm -hmm. And it's a protection when you need protection. And when you're young, a lot of times, I know when I was young, as a young parent, and people in, when we were young, they could have freedom to buy these cars and things to drive. We had to ride the bus to work. And there was one time when I was coming home on the bus, and I had this, to catch the bus a very dangerous part of the city. And where I was, where I was catching the bus, there was a doorway, and there was a group of men standing in back of me. And they were asking questions about money. And I just said, Talk to the Lord and said, Lord, you have to help me because the people man made one step for me and went out the middle of this street and screaming out as loud as I can. And when I held my head up, the police said, drove up, looked at me, stopped right there. And when the bus came, so the block came around and got in the back of the bus, I got on the bus. And I said that to say, we have to trust the Holy Spirit in our growth, in our teaching, and to be there when we need them in every circumstance, that we need them everything and everything we go through life. Because the Bible said, lean not to your own understanding, 
but in all your understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, he shall direct your path. And as you walk through life, those scriptures come to you to lead you and give and build up your faith and your trust. And every experience, one experience, when you go through one experience, that builds up your faith for the next experience, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we do have that faith. I'm not saying that we're perfect in it. Because like the Bible says, the more we grow, the more we'll know, we'll know how to trust. It's all about trust and believe faith, which is faith. Faith is the substance of things, so for the evidence of things not seen. So you don't see it, you just have to believe it. You know? Amen. One of the things, too, and, and we will be discussing this, particularly when we get to the gifts of the Spirit, one of the things that we, we need to understand is that whether it's your parents' generation or it's your generation or it's, it's a third generation, the reality is this, is what God calls us to is never possible. It's impossible. Right. Uh, what whatever uh, your parents haven't lived lived up to, it's because what they were trying to live up to is impossible. And whatever you want to see take place, as opposed to be talked about, is impossible. It is when the Holy Spirit really moves in our life is when we actually come to a place where we understand that what God requires of us is impossible. That's when the Holy Spirit starts to move. Part of what has happened with our generation, that's my generation, which would be the generation of your parents, is that we were raised in a culture that was at the epicenter or the height of, of performance. Everything is, a, being an American, it's about performing. It's about excelling. It's about performing. It's about doing things right. It's about getting things right. And there's a when 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 you're when when you're driven by performance, when you're motivated by performance, performance is actually the antithesis of grace. Everything that we're talking about here, it has to be talked about because it's not talked about. We're gonna we're gonna be looking for the demonstration of these things, but we're still just like even Peter understands who Jesus is, but he understands he's a Messiah, but he still has a false concept of what it means to be a Messiah. The things actually have to be spoken about because as they're spoken about, they begin to shape an understanding, a framework, a positioning, a, a, a direction of our spirit that then we can receive it when God sends it. When, when, when God does something, he always announces what he's going to do first. So he does, he, everything is about the word. Everything is, a, it's, it's proclamation, it's the gospel. He announces it so that when it takes place, we're prepared for that announcing. That announcing washes our minds, it renews our minds, it preps us to receive what God is going to do. So we've, we've been raised in a performance uh, kind of uh, a, a reality, and performance means you have to do this and do that and do this and do that in order to qualify for the blessings. That's the antithesis. That's the antithesis of it. That's how, but see, but that's how what America, see, see what we're understanding now in the church is that so much of what we've called the church, so much of what we call Christ, so much of what we call the truth had nothing to do with Christ and had nothing to do with the church. It, had, it was our culture. Mm -hmm. And see, that's where, see, this, this exaltation of American culture has has actually it it the effects of an idol is that if you worship an idol, then you receive the rewards of an idol. And the rewards of performance are this: if you do well, you live; if you don't do well, you perish. And so, what our generation has had that we've had to go full circle to understand that that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel is what we're talking about here. It's God freely gives. See, even when I when I, I'm sharing these things, that that I, I I'm sharing these things and saying, boy, that's 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 a good message. I ought to believe it. You know, this is this is something great. I ought to, I ought to believe it. But yet, I will preach these things and I'll walk out of here and fall back into performance orientation instead of and saying, God, why is this happening? Or saying, just allow my glory to come into your midst. Just receive what I have 
to give from you. And as you say, not only talk about it, but actually demonstrate. And when I say demonstrate, I want people to be confused. Like, it would be nice to see my parents actually pray. Yeah. It would be nice. Oh, I pray to God all the time. I hear that to this day. I never seen them pray. So, like, as a like a child and the younger kid, because the young kids that's underneath me, I feel really bad for them. Because my people who have kids are not doing the same thing that their parents do. Sure. Not showing the relationship part with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Well, that's it, you just said the word again. I mean, it's relationship. You said trickle down. That's right. where the trickle down comes is the relationship right. and being more open about things and not hiding what you're doing. Okay. Okay. I'm just that's what I mean by demonstration. Like actually seeing Absolutely. our parents in relationship and being able to utilize that in our day to day life and not say I cuss people out at work. Well, don't you don't you just don't you just them? How do you say the same? Sure. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like having that every day. And current and pruning ourselves so we can get to the point where we are walking. But that's and what our lives are glorifying our Father in every aspect of our life. We, the, we're trying to do that because we're going to, we're, we're, we're not perfect. And that's why we, we are humble enough to know that. But that's what I mean by demonstration. That's why we need the church. That's what the church is for. But we are the church, though. Right. But, but, the, but, yeah, but the church, the, the 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 church is the relationship. The church is that what you're saying. Are you talking about bricks and mortar? You're talking about us as individuals. No, she's uh, us as individuals, right? Uh, fellowshipping with each other. Right. right. The, 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 the church is the demonstration of how you receive the spirit. It should be. It should be. That's what I'm getting to. It should be. It should be. But but Anne's, but what one is saying it should be and Anne is saying and it is. And it, and it is. It should be and without without be without without the church receiving the spirit, it wouldn't be the church. That's right. Right. That's true. I'm, yeah, I'm not I'm not negating that. So the <laughs> so the, the 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 my parents weren't believers. So I never got that from them. I got that parenting from the church. You know, and that's what you have to do. You have to look to the church, to to other believers, to fulfill that need in you, to to be able to see how to receive, how to position yourself, what posture you need to take to receive the Spirit, and you need to immerse yourself in the Word of the Father, who is your real parent. That's, I don't, I don't know. No, amen. Amen. You know, you know uh, when the Holy Spirit, is, the Bible said the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into all truth. And like she says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you, got, you want to know what the will of God is concerning your life. And so you search the scriptures. You go to church, you listen to the pastor, and you, then you come home and you search the scriptures. To uh, And then, if you have children, if you love your children, you won't pray with them. You want to teach them the word of God, not only at church, but at home also. I know with my children, I know if I, if I said, you can't play with this one and you can't play with that, those are the very ones they don't want to play with. Mm -hmm. So what I did, I just had, uh, I decided to fix some lunch and invite the children in for lunch, but they had to have Bible study first. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and some of them, they want their cake for the lunch. But I said, no lunch until I come <laughs> So, you know, I mean, that's the way the Holy Spirit led sure. me. Sure. So, so, if you trust God, if you, when you have the Holy Spirit, it's not going to lead you alone. But we have to listen, have the ear to hear what He's saying to us, and then we have to have a will and spirit to follow. Because we're learning day by day, we'll never know it all. But, and if you, we'll never get to the place that we know everything. We should have an open air to want to learn. And so as I am, I feel I can't learn enough. Amen. I'll be so the older, I, the older I get, the more I need to learn. Amen. One quick thing yeah. I wanted to say too is that, you know, my mom was always reading the word, always, right. you know, praying for us, being with us. And uh, I saw a demonstration of the Holy Spirit in my parents. And I said, I do not want to be like my mother. I am not going to be some martyr and put up with all this. I'm not going to be like that. So I went the opposite way. Even though I, it was demonstrated to me, even though I saw it, 
I did not receive it. But when the Holy Spirit came, when he spoke to me personally and said, this is it, here's where it is, I fell on my face. And, you know, but it's a personal relationship. Right. My parents can't show me the way unless the Holy Spirit quickens it to me and then says, that's what that was all about. Right. right. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I did not... I was making a, a, a slight point, I'm saying as a body, because even when we come to church, we really don't, as a body, know how to love one another. That's okay. Love one another. Truly. In real life, we see God, the God in you, there's a God in me. I mean, there's, 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 we have to understand there is a disconnect with that showing in the church. Am I right or not? Uh, to some right. degree, right? There, there so, is, there so is. because you know, because there's people now who say they love God, but they don't fear God. So that's a disconnect as well. And the fact that we don't have an understanding as a whole. I'm going from what I see every day from campus ministry and everything else. Um, you know, because I deal with young people who don't have nothing. They don't have nothing to go by. I was making a point that sure. when they encounter people who say they church people, they just see religiosity. They just see a pseudo. You know, a pseudo friendliness that you can get from anybody, but not the real. Okay, the, like you said, person. It's a every man's persuaded by his own. You know, in common with the with the Holy Spirit. But in the sense, as a body, we should at least try to pull or try to strive to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit to the best of our abilities. That our lives is an attempt to glorify our Father in our lives of every day. That's all I was trying to say. Yeah. That's all I was saying. I mean, I was using the parents' example as a means of demonstration because we can be talked to death, but there's no way of getting to a point where we're actually getting, okay, this is how we should talk about receiving because there need to be a, a discussion on how we should receive because receiving is just now it's abstract. We, we, we're in a society that's Facebook to death and everything social. So getting to practicality that some old school, not all of it, is uh, helpful to some way for us as a body to grow together so we can be on one court. I'm sorry. That's I okay. feel like I, I missed the point. I did not no, you didn't miss well. the point. You're ready to come square. We hear your point. We hear your point. We hear your point. It's, it's <laughs> legitimate. All right, let's, let's finish this here and then finish John 17. Um, uh, and, and we're going back to um, the, the, after the translation of John 16, 13, and 14. The, uh, the second long paragraph on page 51. And if you drop down to the fourth line, it talks about the interdependence between the work of the Son and the ministry of the Spirit that it affirms. On the one hand, the Spirit depends upon the Son for the content he conveys to us. Jesus says the Spirit will take what is mine and share it with you. So the Spirit depends on the Son for the content of the Gospel. That's what Jesus gives to the Spirit. He says, without the Son, the Spirit would have nothing to convey because he brings no content of his own. On the other hand, without the Spirit, what the Son has would be simply shut up in himself. He'd have the, what is his, but it would be simply his. When he shares it with the Spirit, it's the ministry of the Spirit to convey it to us and open us up to receive it. Each depends on the other. So, so the Spirit and the Son, their relationship is modeling what it means to be distinct but interdependent. The Son cannot do what he does without the Spirit, but the Spirit cannot do what he does without the Son. We cannot do what we do without each other. Again, it just, 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 just to, just to take, for instance, we will go to this one table there, Olva and Joyce. We've got the the voice of the young, the voice of the old. We've got the voice of two voices, two different generations. We need to hear both voices. We need to hear what Olva said. We need to hear what Joyce said. We need to hear both voices because they are distinct voices, but they're interdependent. The Spirit and the Son don't get into a fight about each other about content and conveyance. They don't get into a, a fight about it. We're not going to get in a fight about the older generation versus the voice of the younger generation. Both voices need to be heard. Both voices need to be expressed because we're distinct but interdependent. 
Now that leads us finally with this working definition of glory. I just want to finish in John 17. So, so if glory is one divine person sharing what is his with another divine person, let's interpret Jesus' final prayer in that context. John 17, 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, now he, he, this is his high priestly prayer. The upper room discourse is over. What he needs to share with his disciples is over. He announces to them, he's leaving, but the Spirit is coming, and yet he's coming again through the Spirit. Now he's going to go to the cross. And, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is interesting because it's in the way this upper room discourse, the way it's shaped is, is, is it, it, it answers the, 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 the conflict that Olvin raised. Jesus does talk about the things with his disciples in chapters 14, 15, and 16, but then he goes and he demonstrates. He does. It's not an either or. It's a both and. Jesus speaks to them, and now he's about to go to the cross and model exactly what he's saying and set in motion exactly what he's saying. And that's, again, that's what leadership does. Leadership teaches, but then leadership models. Leadership teaches, then leadership acts. Leadership teaches, then leadership imparts, and it brings it to pass. So now Jesus is going to bring it to pass, but he... But notice, between the talking and the doing, there's praying, too. Everything is always in three. So we talk, we, we pray, and then we do. We better get that prayer in there. If we don't get the prayer in there, neither the talking nor the doing is any good. Yes, Joyce? Well, as Christians, is that, isn't that what we should do with our children? We should teach them to be an example yes. of what we're teaching them. And we should be praying for them. Sometimes I find that I don't say anything and I don't do anything, but I'm on my knees quite a bit for my children. Yes. I find that too. So Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. And notice he says, glorify your son. Share something of yourself with me. Give me something that I may what? glorify you. Give me what is of you. Give me something that is yours, that brings your glory to me, that I in turn might receive that glory and give something back to you. See, it's a process of glory. God's glory, when we receive, when God gives his glory, we receive his glory, and then we give his glory back. It's a process of glory. Glory replicates itself. Glory replicates itself. He says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now it's interesting. What is the, the, the thing that the divine father gives to the divine son? He gives people to the son. The father's presenting the son with his disciples is an act of glory. It's, it's one divine being giving something to another divine being, and it's glory. And again, that's why I have said, as a pastor, my most valuable resource is not money. My most valuable resource is not gifting. My most valuable resource is not concepts. My most valuable resource is See, that's where, that's where, that's where, when the Father gives a pastor people, that's why, why losing people is, is the most difficult thing that you can experience. It's like losing a child. It's like losing a spouse. It's like losing a brother. It's like losing a sister. Because the people that are given are God's gift. They're God's gift. And Jesus says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. The gift is eternal life given to people. So, so when we talk about God's glory, now we're, 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 we're trying to accumulate concepts that help us to understand glory. So, so, so let me get some room here. All right, we start with glory. That's what one divine person gives to another divine person. What is it that the Father gives to the Son? He gives life, 
eternal life, Trinitarian life, eternal relationship. It's the relationship that the Father has with the Son that creates relationships in the people whom God the Father gives to God the Son. So what is it really that, that the Father gives to the Son? He gives relationships to the Son. There's the glory of God. See, the glory of God. We all want to see the glory of God. You know what we think the glory of God is? Well, just depends on our background. Toronto, Azusa Street. You know, we think of glory in terms of a, you know, a, a miracle crusade. But what, what Jesus is defining glory is that which brings relationships between people and God and between people and each other. He says, and this is the purpose of eternal life. What's the purpose of eternal life? To know God. Well, what is knowing God? Is that not relational? To know God and to know Jesus who is sent on a mission to to know the one sent on a mission. To be sent apostolically is to be sent on a mission. So notice what, what God's glory does. It brings forth life. And life always answers the two questions we talked about yesterday. Who somebody is and what somebody does. and But you can't just have what somebody does apart from who they are. You do things that are rooted in the relationship that we have with God. So the purpose of eternal life is that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. See, Jesus, as he's praying to the Father, he's rehearsing his history. He's rehearsing his life story. Because it's giving him strength. He's saying, this is the purpose for which I was sent. I'm going to go to the cross and face something that no human being has ever faced, will ever face, could ever face. I'm going to take the sin of the universe upon me. I'm going to take all the, the, the demonic pain and sorrow and hurt and woundedness into me. I'm going to be rejected by my father. My relationship with my father is going to be broken. And the only way I can motivate myself to do this is I have to remind myself of God's purpose. God raised me up to do this. So, so he's, it's like he's, he's retelling the story that the Father has told him for all eternity. He's retelling himself the story in the prayer. Do you understand that prayer? It is talking to God. It's listening to God. But prayer is also rehearsing the purposes of God to God in your own presence. And I can't tell you how many nights I, I go to sleep on the floor, on my face, and I'm just, I'm going over my life story. I'm going over my life purpose. I'm rehearsing what God has done, why God has called me. And I'm crying out to God and saying, Father, you got to help me keep going. Father, you, you, you need to, 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 I know this is your will. I know this is truth. I, even though all the voices, all my experiences are trying to tear that reality down, and I rehearse the story before God. I'm telling God my story. I'm rehearsing it. And Jesus continues, I have glorified you on the earth. What does that mean? You've given me something that's glory. I have received it, and now I'm responding back to you and giving it back to you. I have glorified you on the earth. I finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In essence, Jesus is saying, I can do this, Father as long as I know I'm in relationship with you. I can do this, Father, as long as what's at the center here is not power and not character, but relationship. I can do this. And glory, he's just saying, Father, you have shared everything that is yours with me. Just share it more with me now to give me the strength to do what I need to do. Now that's how glory works in our lives. That's the glory of God. The glory of God is simply asking God to come 
and through the Holy Spirit, share what is His with me. Share what is the Son's with me. And that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. God, the Father and Son, gives Himself to us through the Holy Spirit. That's glory. That's glory. That's the glory of God. That's the glory of God at work. All the glory of God is not do this or do that or, or help me to experience this. It's give yourself to me, Lord, through the Spirit. That's the glory of God. And then it, the passage finishes, and we look at the 20th verse. Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone. After he prayed for himself in the first five verses, he prays for his disciples uh, in verses uh, 6 through 19, and then verse 20, he prays for us. He says, I do not pray for these alone, my immediate disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their work. Here's how it works. The Father shares something divine with the Son. That's glory. The Spirit then takes what is of the Father's and of the Son and shares it with the disciples. That's glory. They share it with us. That's glory. That's how the gospel works. We pass the glory on to one another. That's really the purpose of ministry. That's the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit. Pass the glory on. It's not to coerce people. It's not to get people to do what we want. It's not to somehow uh, feel good about myself or look at my identity. I'm a pastor. I have this great church. It is about sharing the glory of God with people. That's the real. That's the. That's what ministry is all about. It's sharing the glory with people. Sharing the glory with people. So when I'm in a situation of ministry, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to. Focus on where the glory of God is and just share it with others and impart it to others. Find a way to take this situation, this life situation that this person is in, and impart the glory of God. And you know what? It's interesting because it's it's funny because how does the Father share the glory with the Son at this point? Through the cross. And see, this is this is where you lose people in the equation a lot of times. The glory of God always passes through the cross. See, sometimes, this is what will happen as a pastor. You're dealing with somebody and you're saying, Lord, I want to share the glory with this person. <coughs> the Lord kind of shows you the route that that person's life is going to take. And sometimes, it's, it's, a, it's a route of wonder, and it's a route of awe, and it's a route of healing, and it's a route of redemption. But every once in a while, it's a route of suffering. It's a route of the cross. And so you say, okay, got to go through the cross here, Lord. So I got to step back here. I got to step back. Because my human human nature is to spare people pain. And that's, that's, I, I spent my entire life trying to spare my children from pain. And guess what? They grew up and they flee from pain. It was like, why did I do that? It, that you don't spare your children from pain. Yeah. What you do is you lead your children through healing and redemption and glory, but you don't spare them pain because that's a way that God's glory is also manifested. And so you start seeing it, and so you say, all right, I know right now. And and what I'll normally say is it's hands off in this situation. Pastor Ellis has to step back. And I don't know because the Lord will say to me, you, you don't even get near to what I'm doing with this person. Hands off, step back. They're going through the cross. And on the other side of the cross, you can be there to impart the glory to them. What happens is a lot of people here, and Jesus has said it. Jesus has said it. There are many people, they will not embrace the cross. They, they like the blessing part of God, the redemptive part of God, the healing part of God. But all of us who've been at this for any amount of time, success in the Lord, know there's a cross. Too. There is a cross. And there are times... And you just, what you do is you, you try to negotiate people through the cross. It comes in many different ways. For Jesus, he knows facing the cross, he can face the cross with the glory of God. And he knows that the other side of the cross will be even a greater glory. So he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. We just keep passing the glory on down with each other. And he says, I pray that they all may be one, Father. They may be unified. They may be unified 
as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be unified in us, that the world may believe that you sent me on a mission. And so we go from glory to eternal life to now unity. And what kind of unity is it? It's relational unity. Unity is always relational unity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are distinct but interdependent. You know what that means? There is unity in diversity. Their distinction is their diversity. Their interdependence is their unity. That's relational unity. It's not some kind of theoretical, hypothetical, supranatural kind of unity, although it is those kind of things. But it's actually, it's relational unity. It's the relational unity that I have with my wife when I don't feel like I love her. It's the relational unity that my wife has with me when she disagrees with me. It's the relational unity when I think what she's doing is wrong. It's the relational unity we have when we have a very significant difference of opinion. It's the relational unity when we hurt one another deeply. See, relational unity, it's a whole different dimension from simply we're on the same page. It is a position that you start with. And you know where you start with it? At the altar when you say, I will, I do, I take this woman to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, or poorer, in sickness and health, until death do you part. You have made a covenant there. You've said, before we even experience the difficulties of life, we are declaring we will have a unity that transcends all those things. The relationship is more important than our own individual experience of the relationship. And that's what Jesus is praying for here in John 17. Because his relationship with his father right now is about to be shattered. The father is going to turn his face from the son. He's going to put the full curse of the law on the son. He's going to make the son to become sin. And he's going to allow every demon in hell to stick his poisonous fangs into his son. And his son says before it, that's okay. The relationship is more important. Let it come, Father. Because the relationship is why this is going to last. Not the experience of the relationship. The commitment to the relationship. See, that's the kind of unity the church has to have. The church yet has to have. And he continues on, and he says, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. And we're back to glory. We start with glory. There's glory in the middle, and there's glory in the end. It's this constant giving by the Holy Spirit, what belongs to the Father and what belongs to the Son, that guarantees ultimately the church will survive. And notice what it says. When this relational unity is demonstrated, the world will believe that you sent me. And it'll be way more, like Olden says, it's way more than just talking about Jesus. It's demonstrating Jesus. It's demonstrating the reality of the Trinitarian life. And so John, in a, a completely different way, is saying the same thing Matthew said back here. He's saying the same thing. We're being brought into the Trinitarian life of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I in them, you and me, that they may be brought into perfect unity, it says. Unity in oneness. Perfect in unity. Perfectional unity is relational unity. Not unity that never disagrees or never has fight. When I hear people saying, yeah, we've been married for so many years and we've never had a fight. I'm like, Man, you know, but what do they each got? They got, they must have somebody on the side, you know, and that the person on the side is the one they have a fight with. That's not real. That's not real. That's not real at all. That's not human. That's like a, you know, that's like a, that's like a cartoon strip. You know, it's not real. But 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 this relational unity is real. Relational unity and relational unity has the final say. And relational unity trumps all the difficulties. I and them, you and me, that they may have this perfect relational unity that the world will, may know that you have sent me and you've loved them as
as you have loved me. And now it brings in love. And not only is the Father the lover and the Son the beloved and the Spirit the bond of love between them, but the Father is the lover and we are the beloved. This, that's what boggles my mind. Now that verse boggles my mind. The Father has the same kind of love for those of us who have been brought into this Trinitarian life as he has for the Son and, he, and as the Spirit is. Unbelievable. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. And what you share with me, <coughs> one divine person sharing with another divine person, I am now going to share with my church, with my people. And that's glory. And it's a glory that says, you love me before the foundation of the world. Jesus was loved before the world was created. If we are loved the same way Jesus was loved by the Father, we were loved before we were ever created. God loved us before we were ever created. Which means his love transcends our historical experiences. His love transcends our failures, and it transcends our success. It's not about our failures or our success. It's about his love for us. And see, this is to live in that kind of reality. Is it's 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 we're not denying history. History is real. We have real wounds. We have real pain that we have experienced in history. But there's this kind of transcendent reality that kind of lifts us out of history into this eternal reality because it's eternal life it's uncreated life it's life that exists before we we ever existed and to enter into that and experience that is actually what lifts us above our own historical issues that's what deliverance really is it's just lifting us out of the, the history that that of the woundedness and the pain and lifting us into a into a, a, a history, an eternal reality that knows that we were loved by God before we were ever created and we ever made a mistake and anybody ever made a mistake toward us. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And knowing is what? That's relationship. And I have declared to them your name. That name is who you are and it's what you do. And I will continue to declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. And that final statement in his prayer is, I'm going to constantly remind them of who you are. We need constantly to be reminded of who God is because our, our own historical reality makes us forget who God is all the time. Somebody does something to us, a bad thing happens in our life, we get confused, perplexed, the devil knocks us around, life deals us uh, uh, some bad cards, and it's easy to forget who God is. It really is. So Jesus is saying, so I pray that you keep reminding them who you are. And it's like I, I come before the Lord. I say, man, I'm back in the same place for the 900th time. And the Father says, that's okay, son. I'm glad you're back for the 900th time. And tomorrow when you're back for the 901st time, I'll be glad too. But it's okay, son. I have to remind you who I am. And see, it really is, I think as Christians, what happens, we forget who God is. And that's when we stumble, but then we remember who he is, and that's when we're back on the track. And life is life is about remembering and forgetting. It's about remembering and forgetting. So ultimately, though, Jesus is praying these things to the Father. And we know that when you pray according to God's will, you get the answer to your prayer. How many of you think Jesus prays according to God's will? So how many of you think Jesus is going to get his prayer answered? And that's where we'll close the night with John 17. The thing I love about John 17 is not so much that Jesus is going to answer our prayers, but that we become the answer to Jesus' prayer. And ultimately what the church is called to become is the answer to this prayer. So Father, I thank you. We had a lot of discussion, a lot of stuff we talked about. Uh, Father, we've got three more nights. We've got a lot more things to talk about. But help us, Father. Be with us, Lord. Send us the advocate, send us the helper, send us our comforter, Lord God, that he may share with us the things of you, Father, and the things of your Son, that we may walk in glory and share glory with one another, share glory with our neighborhood, Lord, share glory with our generation, Lord, share glory with our city. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, brother.
We'll see you tomorrow. Uh -huh. I lost a page. Read this. I highlighted there. I think it, it, it answers your question a little bit better than I did. And I do, I have three guests. When is what I'm trying to say though? I know. <laughs> but it's what I was trying to say too. Oh, okay, you're just saying it. Yeah. yeah.